Hello, everyone. Welcome to Community Bookstore's virtual event series. My name is Noah Mintz. I'm the store's event director, and Community Bookstore is celebrating over 50 years of business. We credit the continued support of readers and writers for this milestone and translators. So thank you for spending the evening with us. Uh, I'm very thrilled today to be collaborating once again with our friends at New York Review Books to welcome Mark Palazzotti for the release of The Drunken Boat, his new edition and translation of the selected writings of Arthur Rambo. And he is joined in conversation by Chris Clark. Now, a little housekeeping before I introduce our guests. Uh, we've enabled Zoom's auto transcribe settings. So if your version of Zoom is up to date, click on the live transcription button at the bottom of your screen to enable closed captions. If you have any questions for tonight's guests, please do click on the Q&A button, which is also at the bottom of your screen. We will be asking those at the end of the program, so please don't be shy. There's also a chat box, which I'll be posting a link to buy tonight's book if you haven't already. And one caveat is that we're all at the mercy of our home internet connections. So please bear with any technical issues that could arise and we'll try to resolve them as quickly as possible. Uh, we have some really exciting virtual events planned for you this summer. So head over to our website, communitybookstore.net and sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date. One that I wanna point out in particular is next Thursday, August 4th. We're very thrilled to collaborate again with NYRB to welcome Nicholas Del Banco and Susan Cheever to discuss E.E. E. Cummings' novel, The Enormous Room. That program is up on our website now and taking registrations. So now a little about tonight's guests and we will get started. Marc Palazzotti has translated more than 50 books from French, including works by Gustave Flaubert, Patrick Modiano, Marguerite Duras, André Breton, and Raymond Roussel. He's the recipient of numerous prizes and the author of 11 books, including The Revolution of the Mind, The Life of André Breton, Highway 61 Revisited, and Sympathy for the Traitor, A Translation Manifesto. His essays and reviews have appeared in the New York Times, the New, the New Republic, the Wall Street Journal, Art News, The Nation, Parnassus, Book Forum, and elsewhere. He lives here in Brooklyn. And Chris Clark is a scholar and literary translator currently living in Philadelphia. His book-length translations include work by Raymond Queneau, Pierre Macrolan, uh, Eric Chevillard, and Ria Giraud among others. He was awarded the French American Foundation Translation Prize for Fiction in 2019 for his translation of Marcel Schwab's Imaginary Lives, a prize for which he was also a finalist in 2017 for his translation of Nobel Prize winner Patrick Modiano's In the Cafe of Lost Youth. Chris is a founding co-editor of the online jur translation journal, Hopscotch Translation. So without any further ado, I will leave it to you two. Mark and Chris, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you, Noah, and hello, everyone. Thanks. Um, well, Mark, we're uh, we're back together again for our third public event. Uh, Stop meeting like this. Six years. Yeah. Um, too bad it's not in person this time. Let's talk about your new book. Um, let's start with an easy one. Uh, I'm there sure a lot no of easy ones. there are no easy ones. Well, we'll start with a, a straightforward one. Um, there are surely many of the listeners tonight have have heard or read Rimbaud before. Why Arthur Rimbaud and what in your mind makes him and his poems relevant 150 years after they were written? Yeah, uh, I mean, why Arthur Rimbaud for me? Because I've loved his work since I was coincidentally enough 17 years old, which is when I discovered him. Um, I wasn't serious either. Uh, <clears throat> and I've they've just accompanied me throughout my life but why him now? I think that Rambeau is one of those figures who, I mean, you know, the, the, the phrase ahead of his time is of course such a cliche, but I don't think that one could have understood Rambeau and what he was doing in the 19th century when he wrote. I don't think people could, understood, could have understood what he was doing even in the early part of the 20th century, although obviously he had a great influence on the Surrealists and any number of other modernist uh, figures. But to me, Rambo really begins to have resonance in the late 20th century and now because his attitudes seem very, very current. Um, they're, they're, they're sardonic, they're critical in a way that we've been seeing recently and that we certainly saw in the 60s. Um, there's a, uh, what I would call an attitude. Uh, he was anti-militaristic, he was anti-authoritarian, he was a free spirit, he was... Um, uh, he believed in, in uh, he was a sort of an avatar of, of sexual fluidity and, and uh, non-gender uh, identity. He uh, was, you know, in so many ways, he, he embodied a lot of the attitudes and a lot of the stances that have become much more current today and at the time were absolutely not the standard fare. So 
and that that comes through in his work as well. Uh, you know, there again, there's an attitude, and and the reason that I was one of the reasons that I was inspired to retranslate his work, even though there have been quite a number of them, is that I never quite felt, despite the brilliance of some of the visions that exist, I never quite felt that this was that I was reading a Rambo in English that sounded like the Rambo in French. Now obviously different language, different sonority, different rhythms, the whole thing. But what I'm talking about is a tone, that there's a, there's a voice, there's a tone coming through Rambo that's a kind of an essence that transcends the actual language and the actual time. And I never quite felt that it was there. So that, that's what I was really trying to capture with these. You've already preempted my second question, but we'll work around it. Sorry um, about that. No, that's fine. Um, as you point out, um, well, we could call this a retranslation. We can call this a new translation, I'd prefer. Uh, but we'll get to that in a moment. But evidently, Hambo in English isn't a new thing. Um, I did a little bit of digging, and the rough outline works like this. So first translated uh, into Spanish in around 1900, German and Bulgarian translations around 1920. Uh, the first book-length translation of uh, into English of Rimbaud's work, as far as I can tell, was prose poems from Les Illuminations, uh, translated by Helen Rutham, who was Edith Sitwell's flatmate and former governess. And Sitwell wrote the introduction. Um, there was a first version published in a small edition in Paris of The Season in Hell in English around 1932, around the same time that Muriel Rukeyser was working on a translation of the same book that was just published a few years ago. Um, in the United States, the first season in Hal is 1939. That's Delmore Schwartz. Um, uh, as Kenneth Rexroth later put it, the trouble with Delmore as a writer was that he didn't read French, which led to the disaster of his translation of Arthur Rimbaud. That's a really funny book. Um, so, New Directions uh, replaced that translation with the Louise Verres in 1945, which she again revised in 1952, and that translation is still in print from New Directions. Um, the first that I can tell, the first real introduction into the United States of, of Rimbaud's work was in the little magazine, The Dial, in uh, the January, June 1920 issue. Um, which isn't a terribly surprising thing, considering that Ezra Pound was their foreign correspondent, and he surely uh, tipped them off to uh, to uh, what was coming out in Europe. Um, and he translated Rumble. Uh -huh. um, uh, but yeah, many famous writers and many translators, many academics have tried their hand at Rambo. Uh, we talked the other night briefly about Henry Miller, uh, who gave a shot at it and gave up in a fit of agony and ended up writing a study instead, if you can really consider that to be more about Rambo than about Miller, but I think it's both the time of the assassins, mm -hmm. which is 1946. Um, when he was trying to translate that, he wrote a letter to James Lachlan or just before uh, in 1944, wrote to James Lachlan of New Directions and said, one day when I get a clear breathing st stretch, I may tackle season in hell, not to translate, but improvise, giving my own flavor and savor what I imagine it is and not what it actually reads. Um, the other curious version that I turned up um, that doesn't exist, no one's ever found it, but apparently Zelda Sayer Fitzgerald was working on a translation of the season during one of her sanatorium hospitalizations. Uh, since uh, there are many in print, uh, you walk into any solid bookstore and you're going to see Wallace Fowley, Mason Wyatt, Paul Schmidt, John Sturrock, James Sibley Watson, and even John Ashbery tried his hand at the illuminations. So I was going to say, why more? Why do we need more? And maybe we can... Well, actually, there is something further to say about that, because you... So you were mentioning, I mean, what, what Miller said to James Lachlan, and Miller also says, I think, I think in Time of the Assassins, he makes the remark that he never appreciated or, or fully understood the beauty of Rambo's writing until he tried to translate. I mean, that's a sentiment that I could absolutely subscribe to. I mean, as much as I love the work and as much as I've been reading him, you don't really feel how incredibly, not only, not only uh, 
beautiful but scientific. I mean, how how deep uh, a lot of it is until you actually try to pick apart what he's doing in order to, to bring it into English. But the thing that I was going to pick up was um, Miller's comment about wanting to reinvent it. And I think that you see that in several of the people who have translated Rambo. I think John Ashbery also in his way sort of reinvents the illuminations uh, into a kind of a Ram, Ram Bashbury, uh, you know, mix. Um, and, you know, sometimes I think maybe inadvertently, but I think sometimes very, very intentionally because one of the things about Rambo, like, you know, I, I often think of him in, a, in the same breath as someone like Bob Dylan. Uh, he's one of those figures who people just feel drawn to and compelled to write about, to comment on, to engage with in some way. You know, Dylan is probably the, the, the most written about um, singer songwriter that, that there is, you know, there, I mean, the, the, you know, you could fill bookshelves and bookshelves with books about him and the same with Rambeau, uh, biographies, commentaries and, and translations, because these are all ways of trying to engage with this work that just pulls you in so deeply that reading it is not enough. You, you have to do something more. That's where I was going with this. I think when it comes to something canonical like this, um, it isn't really a question of retranslation. It's it's not as if you're really replacing something, uh, but simply adding another translation. Um, because I don't know that there, I mean, a, a perfect translation of Rambo into English is, I don't believe, possible. I don't. Um, and all of the ones I've read, I've read a a good handful I have three or four here on the shelf and I've looked at a number of others um, they hit on certain things they make certain choices they follow certain paths and each one of those shows us something more in English about what Rambo was doing about the readings of you know very intelligent writers and readers um, I think it's through that variety of different choices and focus that each translator brings an important text to the monolingual reader, uh, but to bilingual readers as well, for that matter. Um, and every choice that a translator makes leads him or her away from other choices. So it is through this multiplicity that readers can get a, can, can get closer to the source text. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, you know, translation is a is a cumulative process. Um, it's to, to to really, as you said, there's no perfect translation of Rambo. There's no perfect translation of anything. Um, of course, but that doesn't mean translation is impossible. It just means, as you say, you make choices. You have to constantly evaluate what it is that's going on in that in that sentence in that phrase in that paragraph whatever your unit of meaning is for a particular moment uh you need to interpret what is the essential thing that's happening there and then how can you bring that forth in the other language and ideally you know often there are many things going on in that in that in that phrase or in that sentence and you try to bring in as many of them as you possibly can but if you have to make choices and if you have to leave things behind then it's important to know at least what it is that you absolutely positively want the reader in your language to to take away and the one one of the ways around that built-in you know the the the, the built-in flaw if you want to call it that or, or the or the built-in condition of, of, of you know the, the the terms of engagement with translation are that the more you read of them the more you begin to fill out and and you know clarify and and, and get um uh, sharpness in that hologram that you are that you are creating in your own mind of what that original book text was. Um, you know, translation is a reading, and and one of the reasons that the idea of a a definitive translation or a definitive you know a, an absolutely perfect translation is is really utopian as far as I'm concerned is that there's no such thing as a perfect definitive reading. Uh, you know, everyone brings their own reading to to a text, and every translator brings their reading to the translation, and so. If the person knows what they're doing, uh, that is going to be a version that corresponds to the way the translator has, has interpreted that text and has read that text. And as I was saying before, my main motivation, my own personal passion in this was to try to create a Rambeau that sounded in my head in English the same way that it does in French. But of course, Wallace Fowley heard him differently and, you know, and John heard him differently and, and you know, these, these various people. So the best thing that a reader can do, and you're right, it's not only monolingual readers, it's bilingual readers as well, is to really put together all of those so that little by little, that that sort of, uh, you know, composite sketch begins to 
to to to take shape and to take the to to, to grow in clarity for us. Some sort of a Venn diagram of meaning going on. Yeah. Um, come back to the methodology in a bit, but let's get a little more biographical for a moment. So when we were speaking the other day and what I garnered from reading the introduction, um, you suggest that Rembo's life and output can at least in a general fashion be broken into three periods. Uh, do you mind elaborating on that? Sure. I mean, uh, so there's the, uh, well, three literary periods, I guess. There's there's the, the poems of youth uh, where he was really learning his craft. And what's interesting in those is uh, there's a lot of verve, there's a lot of energy. Many of them were inspired by his constant uh, 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 escapes from the, the parental home. He was not happy at home. He, he kept running away to Paris or to Belgium where he had friends. Uh, and a lot of the poems were written on the road. I mean, they're these wonderful free road songs that, you know, or, or moments that almost are these little real time, they're tweets essentially, uh, uh, you know, of, of what he was doing. Um, and, <clears throat> and that then shades into a slightly darker, slightly more reflective um, uh, uh, period uh, that begins with his engagement with the uh, Paris Commune, the, uh, you know, the, the, the revolt that happened after the Franco-Prussian War and the, and the, the Prussian occupation of Paris, uh, in which he might or might not have been involved himself, but he was certainly interested, he certainly followed it, and the poems then become more political, they become more acerbic, uh, more bitter in a number of ways. Uh, more engaged and more complex, and that leads into the, what we call the visionary period, which is where he wrote poems like vowels and um, uh, you know some of the ones that that sort of bring in his his interest in alchemy, and uh, that continues on through his time in Paris and ultimately with the season in hell, which was his um, you know his sort of proto memoir in a way or apologia for himself. Um, <clears throat> And then you have the last phase, which is the uh, represented by the Illuminations, which are the first really great book of prose poems. It's not the first prose poems. Uh, Baudelaire certainly was there before him, and as were others, many others. But he kind of redefined what the prose poem was. And those poems, which were never, by the way, collected by Rambo, they were just loose sheets that, you know, thanks to Verlaine and a few other people to whom he just sort of gave these things, they were eventually collated and put together uh, later in the in the 19th century as the illuminations. Um, but those are already much more complex and, and uh, you know, they, they point the way to 20th century poetry and the slightly more hermetic, uh, less, less uh, immediately graspable uh, uh, word clusters and images. And, um, you know, you don't always know what's going on. You really just have to let the language carry you along because a lot of the times it could just feel completely impenetrable and yet at the same time there's this wonderful sense of engagement and, and you know something that reaches out to you and then a fourth period in his life of course would be when he abandoned literature altogether after about uh, 1875 and by 1880 he was in Africa uh, where he began his career as a, a trader uh, for a trading company um, a sales agent basically and he was apparently quite good at it um, and that's how he spent the last 10 years of his life until 1891 when a cancer in the knee forced him to come back to France and, and he died sort of shortly after at the age of 37. So given all this variety in, in his work and we have to keep in mind that this is over what a period of five or six years? Five years, that was it. Yeah. yeah. Um, what was your methodology when it came to deciding what to include in your collection? Uh, you didn't you didn't go for everything. Um, how does one build an anthology of a writer like this? And um, yeah, how did you conceptualize the, the project as a book? Yeah, um, a couple of things. I mean, first of all, you know, any anthology, there's always a little bit of subjective pleasure. Um, so part of it was the poems that I particularly loved. Uh, the poems that I thought were especially important for a reader to know. I'm trying to balance the uh, the weights between someone who knows nothing about Rambo, so for whom this would act as an introduction, and for people who do know his work but still want to have this sort of encapsulated version of his um, of his output, uh, you know, part of it obviously was that the book just could not be long enough to be complete. Uh, I mean, that was just simply the the nature of this particular series, and I think that that's fine. Uh, it was, you know, I, I tried to also concentrate on poems that still speak to us today. Uh, uh, you know, a number of Rambo's poems, I mean, he was 
you know, absolutely restless. So he had a very restless mind. So he was constantly churning things out. And some of them are great. And some of them are, frankly, less great. And some of them are responding to a moment that we no longer have. Some of them make references to a political situation with, you know, that are almost journalistic in their specificity. And so we wouldn't know without a zillion footnotes what he's talking about and probably wouldn't care. Um, some of them are just for his own fun, like the one very long one called uh, What You Say to the Poet About Flowers, which was really just kind of a what the British would call a piss take on the um, on the Parnassian poets um, who he had first appealed to to sort of help him out, and then when they didn't, he sort of turned around and you know and bit them in the in the rear end um, with this long poem that just you know uses all of their tropes and completely makes fun of them. But again, you know, do we really need to have a long poem that's meant to satirize Theodore de Bonville today when nobody even reads <laughs> Bonville or cares? So those were the ones that I thought could be left aside. Sure. There were a number of others that were, um, I wouldn't call them toss-offs necessarily, but they were, you know, they were for fun. There were things that he did with Verlaine. There were things that were just sort of for his own amusement. So I tried to balance, you know, give a, a good range of his output and of his work, um, but at the same time really concentrate on the ones that I thought were, for my mind, you know, to my mind, and again, this is subjective, but the ones that were really um, for the ages, I guess you might say. And so the book has about half of the verse poems, half of the illuminations and all of the season in hell, and then virtually all of his letters from the period he was writing poems. So in other words, from 1870 to 75. Um. Before we dip into the translation itself, uh, another thing I noticed when I was looking through some of the previous translations that I have on the shelf here, um, I've got Wallace Fowler here and the Ashbury and yours, and I note that all three volumes are bilingual editions. Um, with many other writers, publishers are pretty reluctant to publish the French alongside the English. Uh, with, with Rimbaud, this seems to be pretty standard. Um, I think the current New Directions volume is bilingual as well, if I recall. Um, why do you think this tends to be the case more for Rimbaud's work than for others? Is it to do with the brevity of his work and the fact that the French is the public domain and, and it can be included? Or is there something more to it, perhaps a nod to the fact that there are always going to be facets of his writing that can't be conveyed in a single translation and you can provide the sound or, or oh, whatever it is to I go mean beside? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know that that's specific to Rambo. I think a lot of publishers, if they can afford the space, you know, and I'm very glad that Edwin made the decision that we should have the bilingual here. So it's only the letters that are in one language. The rest of it is facing text. Mm -hmm. um, you know, why not? First of all, it keeps me honest, right? I don't have, you know, anywhere to hide. Uh, but, uh, but more to the point, I think, you know, of course, if one has enough French to be able to compare, you already have a bit of that hologram I was talking about before between the French and the English. Um, and on that, I'm just actually wondering, should I, should I give a sample? Yeah, I was going to say, why don't you uh, <clears throat> maybe read us something from that first period? You had picked a few out and uh, start sure. there. Okay, so this is uh, romance, which is sometimes translated novel, uh, but I preferred romance. No one's serious at 17. Nice evening out, to hell with beers and lemonade and rowdy cafes with glaring lights. Let's go to the green lindens on the promenade. The lindens smell good on mild June nights. The air so soft that you close your eyes. Wind laden with sounds, the town is near. Carries the scents of vineyard and beer. And there, a patch of darkest blue, framed by a little branch, pricked by a bad star, that diffuses in soft shivers, small and white. Night in June, 17, you're carried away. The sap is champagne and it goes to your head. You ramble, feel a kiss on your lips that palpitates there like a minuscule beast. Crazy heart crusoes through romances galore. When, in the pale light of a tall street lamp, a young miss passes, all charm and all airs, in the unnerving shadow of Papa's stiff collar. And as she finds you immensely naive while taking her booties out for a stroll, she spins around so quick and alive, the cavatinas on your lips die and fall. You're in love, held up till August. You're in love, your poems make her laugh. Your friends fall away, think you're a bore. Then one evening, beloved bothers to write. That evening, you go back to glaring cafes 
you order beers or else lemonade. No one's serious at 17 when the lindens are green on the promenade. Lovely, thank you. Um, do you want to do at the Green Tavern or my yeah, Bohemia? Yeah, why don't I do that? Um, so this was one of those road songs I was mentioning. This was written during one of his escapades to Belgium. <clears throat> and the Green Tavern actually existed under a slightly different name. This is at the Green Tavern, five in the afternoon. A week grinding down my boots on the stones in my passway. Got into Charleroi. At the Green Tavern, I ordered bread, butter, and ham that was half chilled. Legs stretched contentedly under the green table. I gazed at the artless scenes on the wall. And it was adorable when the waitress with huge tits and lively eyes, not one to be phased by a kiss, brought me bread and butter, all smiles, and lukewarm ham on a colored dish. The ham pink and white, flavored with garlic, and filled my towering mug, its foam gilded by the sun's lingering rays. Marvelous. Oh, it's got a really nice flow to it, Mark. Um, I love that poem. There's just such a feeling of content and and freedom to it. You know, not not that common in Rambo. Uh, there's a lot more anxiety in a lot of his poems, but this one you just you just you just sit there with him, and you can just see this pure contentment of him sitting in this place and having enough money for beer and ham, <laughs> which wasn't always the case. Which wasn't always the case. Um, now. <sighs> With this idea of delineating his short career into three rough parts, you pointed out in your introduction that there is a great deal of variety, even within those periods, um, that his experimentalism led him in many different directions. Um, read a little snippet from your introduction here. You, you wrote, the freewheeling liberties Rambo took with language, his startling imagery and frequent borrowings from the writings of others, what today would be called sampling, and himself, he samples himself quite a bit as well, I might add. Um, these make a precursor of surrealism, the beats, and hip hop, while his use of sonority as a textual generator in poems such as Memory or Metropolitan prefigure data sound poems. His interest in scientific principles as a basis for literature foreshadows the work of Ulipo writers like Raymond Cuneau, Georges Perec, and Harry Matthews. His experiments with verse that eliminated rhyme and meter and the irreverent spirit that drove these explorations would become hallmarks of the century to come. So let's leave aside the question of sonority as a textual generator until, until we get to the, the later section there. Um, to start with, would you mind expanding a bit on this idea of sampling? I find that very interesting. Yeah, I mean, Rembo was, you know, as I said, especially in his early years, he was a he was a sponge. Uh, he had a very agile mind. He was he was a real magpie. He pulled in. I mean, he heard poems. He almost memorized them, you know, at, at first reading, and he read everything. I mean, he was interested in so many different, not just literature, but you know, in alchemy and in chemistry and in physics and in math and you know, all these different things. And he often used little lines or snippets or things from other poets and just plump them in there, um, you know, which is what made me think of sampling is that, you know, the, you will find, uh, one will find, the editors of the play out edition, <laughs> the scholarly play out edition will find, have found um, a number of borrowings from contemporary writers, from, I mean, people who are completely obscure today to well-known poets, to, uh, you know, to, to uh, writers beforehand, people who he admired and then no longer admired, uh, or Michelet, the, the French historian who he was a great admirer of. I mean, there are all these, these little bits and pieces that come out in his poetry, and he had absolutely no shame whatsoever about, you know, feathering his nest with, with other people's words. Um, so, that I think was, you know, it, it's interesting too, because I was thinking the other day that um, something must have been in the air because 1870, which is the first year that Rambo really begins his poetic career to speak of, was also the year that Isidore Ducasse, uh, the, the Comte de l'Autrement, published Poésie, which was this little pamphlet that he published just before he died, which was essentially a bunch of little aphorisms. And one of them was, uh, plagiarism is necessary, progress implies it. Um, and he also, another great watchword that the Surrealist adopted was poetry must be made by all, uh, not by one, but by all. Uh, so the idea that writing came almost from the air that you sort of pulled it in like electricity or, you know, like these vibes and then just sort of generated it out, but none of it was 
was personal, none of it was yours uh, specifically, was something that was sort of coming into being at that time. And it was kind of a direct response to the notion, the romantic notion of the poet as the singular tortured genius who was the only one who had those words. And basically what Rambo is saying is we all got those words, you know, it's just, just use them. I'm going to ask you about the, the science and the Ulipo as well, but I mean, I have to say that the sampling idea is really Cano and Parekh as well. They're both notorious for unmarked citation. Mm -hmm. uh, Cano himself, and I just had to deal with an awful lot of this last year for a book, um, loved to slide in a citation and then change one letter to make it different. Um, and David Bellis had his work cut out for him translating um, Parekh's more notorious book where he apparently just pulled books off his shelves and grabbed a line whenever it felt like it. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe that's also coming from Rambo, but uh, could you tell me a little more about his use of science in his writing and the place of science in his conception of the world? Yeah, well, as I said, he was, you know, he, he had a, a, a very wide ranging mind and he was interested in all these various scientific disciplines. In fact, the last letter in the book, which was from 1875, so really the end of his poetic career, he writes to a friend and he's asking about um, uh, college courses, basically, in chemistry, physics and math um, that he's interested in going into and, and, you know, sort of adopting as a career, studying more more generally. But even earlier on, uh, you know, the, the notion of, you of, um, scientific principles as uh as as a generator of poetry um is is very present and actually this might be a moment if you could stand another snippet of reading uh for me to read um a part of this this letter that he wrote uh in in 71 called the the seer letter uh where he starts expounding a bit to a, a friend of his the um some of the some of these principles so this would give you a, maybe a, a taste of of what we we're talking about please do so this is May 1871. Here's some prose about the future of poetry. No one has ever judged romanticism appropriately. Who would have judged it? The critics? The romantics who so rightly prove that the song is seldom the work? In other words, a thought not only sung but understood by the singer? For I is another. If Copper wakes up as a clarion, it's hardly its fault. That seems clear to me. I'm there to see my thought burst forth. I watch it, listen to it. I attack with my bow. The symphony stirs in the depths or leaps onto the stage. If the old fools had found more in the self than false meaning, we wouldn't have to clear away these millions of skeletons who since time immemorial have stacked up the products of their nearsighted intelligence and boasted of being their authors. The primary study of someone who wants to be a poet is his own consciousness in its entirety. He searches his soul, inspects it, tries it out, learns it. Once he knows it, he has to cultivate it. This seems easy. Every brain undergoes a natural development. So many egotists proclaim themselves authors. There are many others who attribute their intellectual progress to themselves. But the point is to make your soul monstrous. Imagine someone planting and cultivating warts on his face. What I'm saying is that one must be a seer, make oneself a seer, the poet makes himself a seer by a long, massive, and reasoned disordering of all the senses, every form of love, suffering, madness. He searches himself, drinks every poison in him to the dregs, retaining only the quintessences, unspeakable torture that will require all his faith, all his superhuman strength, in which he becomes the greatest invalid, the greatest criminal, the most accursed of all, and the supreme scientist. For he has attained the unknown since more than anyone, he has cultivated his already fertile soul. He attains the unknown, and even when he ultimately loses his mind and stops understanding his visions, he will have seen them. So what if he dies while striving toward new and unnameable things? Other horrible toilers will appear in his stead. They'll begin on the horizons where the first one killed over. So the poet is truly the thief of fire. That's great. I think the next line actually too maybe speaks a little bit to the the opacity in some of his poetry, the, um, the the difficult time we have in following where he's going with some of his analogies, some of his metaphors. Um, he writes in that just the very next paragraph, 
Um, he is responsible for humanity, even for animals. He has to make people feel, touch, heed his inventions. If what he brings back from over there has shape, he gives shape. If it's shapeless, he gives shapelessness. So there, uh, he's not explaining himself. He's engaging in this vision. I almost, I look at this word seer as well. We use seer in English. In the French, it's les lettres du voyant. voyant and it's yeah. liter literally just the seer. Mm -hmm. the I wonder if, if you could maybe write it with three E's <laughs> or, to, <laughs> or pron to pronounce it that way, the seer. Well, I mean, you know, obviously one other possible translation that, it, that occurred to me was visionary. Uh, mm -hmm. which is kind of in there too. Uh, there's also clairvoyant, but that's not quite the same and it has a, a different resonance to it. Um, but finally, I, I went for seer, firstly, because just, it, you know, keeping the idea of seeing front and center and that was, mm -hmm. was important. And also that's the, um, you know, this is one of those cases where previous translations do begin to sort of shade in and color a little bit. This letter is known so much in English as the seer letter, you know, that, that it seemed a little bit um, pointless to try to, to change it too much at this point. Yeah. So now how do, how do you channel the seer? How can you really get behind that veil with him? I know from previous conversations that you and I have had over the years that we are of a mind when it comes to general ideas on the translation of poetry. Um, if we want to use those often tossed around words, words like loyal or faithful, the translations of a poem, um, anything verging on word to word translation, while this almost never comes out well in poetic translation, and definitely not in, in Rimbaud from my experience. Uh, in your translator's note, you write, Rimbaud zipped through many different styles, voices and tones in his rush across the literary landscape. Accordingly, rather than adopt a one-size-fits-all approach, I've employed different translation strategies for different works, ranging from strict rhythm and rhyme to free verse as the music and mood of each piece seem to dictate, while also staying attentive to his use and abuse of traditional forms, as well as to the license he sometimes granted himself to take prosody and wring its neck. Mm -hmm. um, do you mind elaborating on this varied approach, telling me a little more about how you made these decisions, if you can, and perhaps what you think it does to the cohesiveness of the collection and to the voice and the tone that you're looking for? Yeah, I mean, I can understand that, you know, this could end up, this could be a controversial choice, uh, not everyone would agree with it, but I, I think what I was trying to balance here was a lot of the energy of Rambo's poems for me comes from the tension between, on the one hand, a kind of a, a kind of a nonchalance. You know, these poems were generally written fast, but they were also written with a lot of thought behind them. He, he really thought through uh, what he was trying to do, not necessarily thinking through every draft of a poem, but thinking through this sort of project that he begins to outline in the, in the Seer letter. Um, of, of how to get to this essence of poetry and, you know, and make himself a seer. And so there's on the one hand, a, a, a you know, a very um, considered uh, personal philosophical background, but at the same time, a lot of these poems have a great verve and spontaneity to them. So what I was trying to do in getting, trying to get under the skin of these poems was, was to, you know, have my cake and eat it too, basically to try to do both. And sometimes there was something a little bit more formal that seemed to kind of take the take the lead, and other times it was really just about that that rush, uh, you know, that that I, I wanted to preserve. But it was curious, thinkers. Um, I, I found this. I found this with him. I found this also uh, when I was doing some poems by Baudelaire. You can start out doing free verse, and very often the poem itself, as you're working through the translation, as you're revising it, is just pulling you toward a place where. You want to have a rhyme scheme. You want to have rhythm. You want to have, you know, and it might not be exactly the same rhyme scheme as Rimbaud. And I think I use a slightly different rhythm scheme for the for the sonnets. I mean, you know, his sonnets were very traditional in a lot of ways, and he was very aware of the rules of French prosody. He even, I mean, he was he was he was fastidious. He would not rhyme a verb form that ended in s with another one that ended with that didn't end in s, uh, even though they sound exactly the same. And as a rhyme, it would have worked perfectly well. But you know, that was that was a no no at least in the beginning. So you know, there was there was a lot of um, attention paid to the strict rules, 
and at the same time, he's using them, and as I said, wringing wringing its neck because uh, because what he does in the within those rules is really where the modernity lies. So I didn't want to do what some more contemporary translators have done, which is to turn these into strictly modern late 20th century or early 21st century poems. Mm -hmm. Because my sense of it was that at that point, you kind of lose what's really new about them. It just sounds like, you know, good, nice late 20th century poems. But by bringing them back to a place where they are still trying to fit within a certain constraint, and yet at the same time, seeing these things that are completely insane, you begin to understand what was so absolutely groundbreaking and and you know, completely and, and, and totally new about about these poems at the time, uh, and to me that's that's a little bit more where the adventure of it came out. But as I said, part of it too, I didn't want to completely lose the instinctive sense. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it really was, you know, the Green Tavern fell into a freer verse. It just needed to be relaxed, mm -hmm. as he was relaxed sitting under that sitting at that table. Um, some of the others needed to have more of a sense of rhythm, uh, you know, and, and, and sort of go on a, on a kind of a more regular thing and have some internal rhyme and let the music sort of work that way. And I noticed some of the adjustments you'd make to preserve a rhythm and, and compared them back to some of the other translations where when the previous translators, you know, he tends to stack up adjectives or stack up nouns. He likes to have a lot of ands and ofs mm -hmm. and, um, if those terms are often kept in the same order, which previous translators who are being far more literal um, left them in the same order they were written, the rhythm doesn't come out naturally in English. And I've seen in certain places where you've inverted those terms to get a similar um, flow to to your line um, than, than to what he's done. So I did appreciate that. Um, did yeah, you I mean, I think the, the, the one thing that, uh... I mean, again, I, I say this, and I'm hoping that I've achieved it. I, you know, up to the reader to decide. But to me, the one thing Rambo cannot be in translation is clunky mm -hmm. uh, or, or fussy. And there are plenty of translations that I've read, a number of translations that I've read that do seem to be either clunky because they did try to preserve that syntactic order that he had, mm -hmm. you know. But he was doing it in French, and he was doing it with a particular rhythm, and he was doing it with certain rules of, you know, of, of language that we just don't have. And so it just comes out this, you know, it's like a, a flat tire just bumping down the street, um, or it becomes very kind of mannered, uh, which he absolutely was not. So. Mm. Do you want to read us another little something from that middle period, and then we'll just dive into the tail end there? Maybe either Voyal or the chunk from the season where he talks about Voyal, whichever you like. Um, sure. Why don't I? I'll read vowels. Um, <clears throat> so this is actually one of Rambo's most famous poems um, called Vowels. A black, E white, I red, U green, O blue. Vowels, someday I'll relate your secret birth. A bristling black corset of shimmering flies, mizzing about an unbearable stench, gulf of night. E white of vapors intense, Proud glacier spears, ivory kings, Queen Anne's lace. I, shades of crimson, spat blood, comely lips, laughing in anger or penitent drunks. You, cycles, divine hum of iridian seas, piece of scrub ground dotted with beasts, piece of lines that alchemy etches in studious brows. O, oh, great clarion, so dissonant and shrill, silence is crisscrossed by angels of worlds. O, oh, the omega, violet beam of your eyes. Thank you. I think that's still my favorite or one of my very favorites. Um, I was going to ask you about the biographical side, but I think we're going to run out of time if we're going to answer mm. some questions. Why don't we take a look at this idea of sound generation and your attempts to preserve some of the sound games that he's um, that he's playing in, his, in some of the later poems. Um, in particular, I'm thinking of Metropolitan. Um, find the page I've lost my page already 201 um so here he, you uh, he's, go ahead no I was going to say we're actually we are going to run out of time we want to take some questions so do we want to do that or should I just do a little piece of the the title poem since it is the title poem why, why don't um, you do that why don't okay. you do that 
All right. Um, Okay. Yeah, we're just the beginning of it. It's rather long. <clears throat> this is the drunken boat. As I glided down impassive rivers, I no longer felt boatmen guiding my path. Whooping redskins had used them for targets and nailed their nude corpses to the colorful masts. I couldn't care less about the crew or its cargo, Flemish grain or English twill. When my boatmen were gone, and the ruckus all over, the rivers carried me at my will. In the mad undulations of furious tides, in the winter I ran, duller than a child's brain. And in spring, the peninsulas wrenching apart had never split to such triumphant strains. My maritime wakings were blessed by the storm. Lighter than cork, I danced on the waves that some call eternal rollers of victims for 10 nights, never missing the lamp's stupid rays. Sweeter than to children, the flesh of sour apples, the green water entered my hull made of pine and of stains of old vomit and indigo wine cleansed me while scattering rudder and grapple. And from then on, I immersed myself in the poem of the sea, infused by stars and like tessent, devouring the green azure where a floater pale and happy, a pensive carcass might descend. Where suddenly tinting the blueness, the frenzies and slow rhythms beneath the dazzle of day Stronger than liquor, vaster than liars, love's bitter redness ferment and decay. I know the skies bursting with flashes and winds and the swells and currents. I know the dark eve, dawn in its glory and nations of doves. And I've witnessed what men only thought they had seen. I've seen the low sun stained with mystical horrors, illuminate with frozen violet strains, like actors and dramas from antiquity, the distant waves rolling their shuddering pains. I dreamed of green nightscapes with dazzling snows, a kiss slowly rising to the eyes of the sea, the circulation of remarkable step and quick phosphorescence in yellow and blue. For months did I trail like hysterical cattle, the fierce swelling surges assaulting the reefs, not thinking that virgins luminous feet might drive on the muzzle of those sluggish seas. I crashed, don't you know, into fabulous Floridas where flowers combined with the eyes of black panthers in human skin, rainbows stretched like taut like rains beneath the surface of oceans to greenish blue herds. I've seen great fermenting swamps and fish traps amid bulrushes where a leviathan rots. I've seen torrents of water fall into flat calm and distant cascades rushing toward the abyss. And it goes on for another two pages, so maybe I'll stop there. Marvelous, thank you. If you want to know more, you have to buy the book. <laughs> Just the teaser. <laughs> um, should we take a couple of questions from the Q&A, Mark? Absolutely. Um, the first one you might have an answer for, um, due to all of the biographical and critical reading you did for this volume, uh, Will Powers writes, why was Rimbaud so influential on Latin American poetry and fiction? Any ideas? That's actually a very good question. I'm not sure I have an answer to it. Um, you know, I think Rimbaud has been influential on a number of literatures. Um, and I think that part of it was... Part of it was the invention of his work, uh, and part of it was, you know, we haven't really talked about this, but part of it was the myth uh, of Rambo. I mean, that's that's an important component of his staying power, uh, because as, as I think many of you know, so Rambo has this five-year period of absolute, you know, brilliant geyser-like uh, uh, invention of poetry, and then for five years, he kind of bums around, not quite sure what he's going to do. And he ends up in Africa. And then he spends the last decade of his life, as I said, as a, as a, as a trader, as a businessman, and completely leaves that behind. Um, even as his poems are starting to be published back in France, he doesn't, he doesn't want to know about it. You know, when, when businessmen come through from France and say, oh, I think I saw your name in this literary magazine, it's like, change the subject. Um, so that second piece of the life, that second half with its, its real reversal, it's, it's, um, it's, it's complete denial of who he had been, supposedly. It's complete denial of his literary career and of all those ambitions. It's, it's, it's trading of the, you know, as I say, of the, of the uh, poet's pen for, a, you know, a poet's notebook for a, for a, a, a businessman's ledger. Uh, you know, that has been a large part of his appeal because people have just not been able to figure it out. Uh, and if you're, 
you know, a lot of literature professors find this to be this awful shame and a waste. And, you know, how could he possibly do that to his gift? Um, and I talk about it in, in the introduction. I think there are various ways you can read it. But, you know, uh, Andre Breton said that, and I'm sure he wasn't alone, is that a large part of the surrealist interest in Rambo stemmed exactly from that caesura, that, that mysterious break in his life where he goes just from one thing completely to something else. Uh, they found that fascinating. Great. Um, and uh, yeah, note again, as I pointed out, that the first translation of Rambo, I believe, was into Spanish around 1900, which is is much earlier than anywhere else. Um, also, perhaps, if we're looking at him as a precursor to symbolists, the Argentines had a, a, a tight connection and translated a lot of the symbolists quite early as well, including Borges mm -hmm. um, in the 20s and 30s. Um, next question. Um, Please give an example or two of Rimbaud in French and Marx and another's translation to highlight your choices. Well, we can just use that line from Metropolitan because I've got it all handy. Mm -hmm. So this is a good example I found of Mark um, working to preserve some of Rimbaud's sound games uh, that others haven't necessarily worked to preserve. Uh, in Metropolitan, Rimbaud writes, I'll just read this. Fourth par the fourth paragraph here. Des routes bordées de gris et de murs contenant à peine leurs bosquets et les atroces fleurs qu'on appellerait cœur et sœur, damas d'amnon de longueur, possession de féerique aristocratie ultérieure, etc., etc. So in particular, the, the alliteration, the use of vowels, bordé de gris et de murs, et des atroces fleurs et cœur et sœur. Um, now, for example, for Wallace Fowley, these roads lined with fences and walls, their gardens bursting over them, and the terrible flowers called hearts and sisters, damask, damning, damning slowly. Um, he's kept the alliter alliteration that's quite simple to do with, with the damas, but quite literally, his fleur, coeur, and so become flowers and hearts and sisters, which is just direct word-to-word -word translation. Ashbury himself writes, highways bordered by gates and walls that barely contain their groves and the horrible flowers that might be called hearts and sisters. Wyatt Mason, roads lined with fences and walls barely containing their copses, brutal flowers called hearts and sisters. Do you see a theme here? We've all changed the uh, the adjective describing these flowers, but it is indeed flowers, hearts, and sisters uh, in all three instances. Would you read yours, Mark? I will. <clears throat> Roads lined with fences and walls, barely containing their groves, and the horrid blooms you might call plumes or wombs, damas damning in doom possessions of magical reddish, et cetera, et cetera. Bravo. I love it. I love that you've gone for it. That's so great. <laughs> and, Be bold. and semantically, there's still a link there. There's still, you can still read the thread there. You can follow it back to, to what he's building as far as an image. But again, you're not translating words. You're translating images. You're translating visions. Um, with that in mind, anonymous attendee, writes, how contingent on the poetic theory of symbolism do you think Rambo's work was? And I might ask as well, being that you're one of our foremost experts on surrealism, how does this all tie into each other, these movements? movements? Uh, yeah, I mean, Rambo himself was, uh, I, I don't know how much he, he was aware, obviously, of the symbolists. He was aware of the Parnassians probably more than anything, which was a, a movement that came shortly before that. Uh, the Parnassians were uh, you know, they were pretty mannered. Uh, they were, they used a lot of um, classical imagery and, uh, and allusions, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, I think Rambo, you don't really see a lot of that in his poetry, except, as I said, that one poem where he really goes for it, but, you know, but he's really sticking it to them. Rambo was interested in the Parnassians because at the time they were the, they were the game in town. Uh, you know, he was an ambitious little guy and he, he wanted to, be known. He wanted to be embraced by the, you know, the, the cool kids, um, you know, the, 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 po the poets who were really making a name for themselves. And so the first letter that we have from him pretty much, uh, you know, that, that we know of is to uh, Deodor de Bonville, who was uh, one of the prom most prominent of the Parnassian poets and the editor of their 
literary magazine and he submitted a bunch of poems and sent some poems and letters and it didn't really get him much of anywhere um but you know but he was he was aware of them i think more for 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 their their cachet than for, them, for their their actual writing that changes a little bit with um the symbolists and with berlin for example who he really did admire and respect uh you know and, and at one point i think it also in the seer letter later on when he's when he's you know lecturing his friend on after going through the entire history of literature, he sort of comes upon who, who there is today that's worth going through. And after basically dismissing everyone, he says, well, Berlin is, you know, he's a true poet uh, and Baudelaire, those, those two those two were okay. Um, and shortly after that, he goes to Paris and of course meets Verlaine, becomes involved with Verlaine and they have the, the whole uh, melodramatic story that everybody knows. But um, the part of that was based on a real admiration for what Verlaine was doing because he, felt that he too was sort of building poetry on something more than just common sense, essentially. Uh, and I think it was Paul Valéry who said that before Rambeau, poetry, the language of poetry was in common sense. Uh, you know, Rambeau really kind of, he, he blows it up. Uh, you know, he's, he's using poetry in a way that is maybe more familiar to us today because we're used to modern, but what we call modernist poetry being a little bit less penetrable, a little bit more uh, demanding a little bit more of the reader, uh, you know, certainly Ashbery's poems and a number of others. Uh, but that really starts with Rambeau. It really comes out of it, you know, and even Baudelaire who was innovating in the sense that he brought in thematic, uh, you know, themes that were not generally poetic until, until he made them. So his poems are still perfectly understandable. Rambeau just, you know, he doesn't care. Uh, these, these images are coming from someplace deep inside of himself and he's not really bothering to, help you out. Uh, you just have to, you just have to go with it. And that was one of the challenges. I mean, not to, to belabor this too much, but that was one of the challenges of translating is that on the one hand, you want to keep the mystery and you want to keep the ambiguity. But at the same time, I wanted to make sure that I wasn't going down, you know, like Wiley e. Coyote suddenly finding myself over the abyss and about to fall. Uh, you know, that, that you, you want to make sure that you're kind of following him in his path, at least. Um, so there was a lot of that's where a lot of the, the the scholarly research came in with annotated editions, with these wonderful websites that just you know dig in way 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 deep to, to Rambo's work, not because I wanted to explain it. And the you know the footnotes at the end of my book are really more contextual to give you some historical background when needed. But at least I had a feeling that what the, the word choices that I was making in English were buttressed by 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 something well sure and it's when you're trying to preserve ambiguity your word choice is important as well because you want to offer that same ambiguity to your reader Absolutely. but you don't want to send them in the wrong direction by mm -hmm. by choosing the wrong ambiguous way of expressing something let's do one last here stephen ring writes what do we know of his writing process was he a first thought best thought poet or did he revise his work uh, until he thought it was perfect he actually, I don't know about until he thought it was perfect, but there are different drafts of his works. Um, and one way we know that is that he, you know, he was not very good about keeping his work. <laughs> uh, he gave them to, you know, he would stay with friends and just leave a sheaf of poems on the table or just hand them to him or you know, go off. And sometimes he would rewrite the same poem several times over and there were little variations. Um, one place where you can really see it is in the se a season in hell. Um, there's a section called Alchemy of the Word, where he, he he sets in a number of his own later poems, which are already sort of moving toward this much sparer, more abstract, uh, you know, even even more uh, hermetic language. But he had actually written those poems a year or so before. He just didn't have them, so he recreates them from memory. And the differences are really quite amazing because as in recreating them from memory he makes them even more abstract and even more spare so he's sort of moving toward this modernist poetic language uh you know almost instinctively um but at the same time as i said i think that there's also a real spontaneity in verb so it, it's 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 really a tension between the two which is one of the things that makes him so fascinating is that you know he didn't just toss them out and leave them but he didn't belabor them either yeah. last question is mine and then we'll uh, hand it back to noah i was just wondering now, when we're tra when you're translating the work of an important uh, poet, or in this case, maybe a defining or definitive poet, at least as far as French literature goes, I, I think translators and readers alike tend to look on the source text as containing or representing something of the sacred, something of the immutable, the untouchable. Uh, 
um, which leads translators or has led them, I suspect, to maybe feel awkward about deviating from the source text. Maybe that's the reason for some of the excessive literalism we've seen in earlier translations. Um, for good or not, um, that they're maybe more reluctant to deviate than they might be with the work of less important or less canonized poets. Um, does this have a ring of truth for you? And did this sacred quality of the source material impinge upon your freedom in any way? Did you feel self-conscious about trying things? Well, I mean, I feel self-conscious about any translation. I don't know, you know, I don't know if, if a canonical text is, is, is more so. Um, I mean, this, you know, the criticism brings us back to the old debate between fidelity and, and felicity. Uh, you know, my feeling has always been that the more faithful translation has to be unfaithful or, or fidelity is the product of a lot of little infidelities. Let me put it that way. Um, Well-chosen ones, uh, careful ones, you don't want to misrepresent the poet. I've certainly read translations that, you know, tried to grandstand or do something different and innovative. I don't have anything against it, but when it's just simply using that poem to kind of do your own thing uh, in a way that, that denatures the poem, I'm not particularly interested, let's put it that way. Um, but at the same time, I don't think it's actually more faithful to, I mean, you can do a crib, you know, you could say if you want someone to know exactly what, you know, that, that Rambo said, flowers and sisters and hearts, well, fine, you know, yeah. that, that's that's perfectly illegitimate. Really but if you're trying lost. to, but if yeah. you're trying to create a poem and you understand that what he was really doing in that particular moment was playing on sonority and on, on language and on, on uh, assonance, you know, I, I, I think that the the literal rendition doesn't do it. It's, it's actually being unfaithful because that's not really what he was trying to get at, at least in my reading of it. So, you know, well, I think you can- It's key, if it's, if it's not a, great poem in English and it was a great poem in French is it that's not a that's not doing anybody yeah exactly. and, you know I mean we won't get into the whole foreignization debate that's, that's, a, mm -hmm. that's a, for another time but um what I what I would like more than anything is for a reader to come away from these feeling that whatever it is that they took from my English versions of these poems was what they would have taken from reading Rambo in French uh, whether they know it or not, whether, you know, it just needs to feel right. And that means sometimes sticking close, that means sometimes taking some liberties, but always with the idea in mind of what, you know, what would Rambo have done? You know, it's like you have the little, little bracelet around, you know, um, and that's why, you know, that's why you do try to figure out what he was coming from. So you do try to figure out where the sources were, or, you know, what he stole from, from, you know, from de Bonville or whatever, uh, because all of that is part of what he's getting at and how he constructed his poem. And if I'm going to try to get under the skin of that poem to try to create something that represents it, even with different inventions along the way, it still has to be from within his own system. So that, that's about the best I can answer that. Marvelous. Thanks, Mark. Thank I you. That's a really beautiful note to end on. And reading the translations and this gorgeous, this gorgeous book um, side by side with the French, it is a bilingual edition. Um, I, I do really, I did get the, the feeling that they were wonderful poems as Rumble would have written them in English. So thank you, Mark, for your translations. Thank you, Chris and, and Mark, for this fabulous conversation. And those of you at home, thank you for joining us. Uh, hope you'll pick up a copy of The Drunken Boat from Community Bookstore or your favorite local independent bookstore. And hope to see you at another virtual event really soon. Thanks again and have a great evening. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thanks, Noah. Thanks, Community Books. And good to see you, Mark. You too, Chris. Thanks a lot.